In the summer of 1939, uh, tensions were rising in Europe, and the person most responsible for these tensions was the German Chancellor, Adolf Hitler. In June, he began to make demands on Poland. What he wanted was a permanent connection across the Polish corridor here to uh, join Germany with her ethnic cousins in East Prussia. He also wanted to uh, take over the city of Danzig because there was a large German-speaking population living there. Poland, however, let the Germans know that they had no interest in negotiating away any of their territory. And at the time, Poland had an agreement with Britain and France that those two countries would come to her aid if she were to be attacked by a third party. So in pressing his demands, Hitler was risking a war with two of the larger powers of Western Europe. Nevertheless, he persisted through July. And so in order to try and discourage Hitler, England and France sent a joint delegation uh, uh, to Moscow to seek to negotiate a military alliance with the Soviet Union. The Red Army at the time was one of the largest standing armies in Europe, and it was thought with, with the combination of the Red Army and Britain and France, Germany might back off her demands to expand her borders. But that wasn't the only thing that was happening at the time. Back in England, the British Admiralty was stepping up their plans for preparedness. They were uh, withdrawing several merchant ships from commercial service and converting them into vessels that would uh, supplement the Royal Navy fleet. They were turning these ships into hospital ships, into troop carriers, and into a form of fighting ship called an armed merchant cruiser. Now these were merchant ships that had surplus Navy guns mounted on their decks so that they could assist the Royal Navy in protecting the sea lanes that were so vital for the continued uh, survival of the British Isles. Negotiations with the Soviets dragged on into April, or into August, excuse me. And on August 22nd, Germany made a startling announcement. The Germans and the Russians had signed a non-aggression pact. And in its simplest form, this meant that neither country would attack the other country if the other country were to be attacked by a third party. And so that meant that Russia's Red Army was not going to be part of any alliance that might find itself in conflict with Germany. And it also meant that the possibility of war had just grown much more real. So real, in fact, that the American embassies began telling citizens that they should return home immediately because of the threat of war. Now, at the time, my grandmother was visiting relatives in a little town called Street in southwestern England. She'd arrived the first week in August, and uh, she wasn't planning to return to sail back until uh, October the 6th. But the embassy announcement threw all of her plans out the window, and she suddenly found herself scrambling with several hundred other uh, Americans and Canadians trying to get passage on any ship uh, leaving for North America. And she was eventually able to secure passage on the Athenia. Uh, this ship was leaving Glasgow, Scotland on September 1st, and after picking up passengers in Belfast and Liverpool, she was going on to uh, cross the Atlantic and sail to uh, Montreal, Canada. Now, the owners of Athenia saw an opportunity in all of this demand for passenger space. And so, with a week, a week or so before the scheduled sailing date, they converted two large public rooms into dormitories. And they also adopted a policy that every cabin on the ship would accommodate for passengers. So this meant that men and women would be separated in their accommodations and probably some families would be split up. But for all of the inconvenience, uh, it did allow Athenia to book 200 additional passengers. And it's probably why my grandmother was able to get on the ship with less than a week before uh, the sailing date. Now, a few days before she was due to sail, the British Admiralty 
issued another directive for all merchant ships that they should sail blacked out at night because of the threat of war. And so all of Athena's portholes were painted over and all of the large windows and the lounges and other public rooms were boarded up so that uh, no single ray of light could escape the ship at night. Well, September 1st was a Friday, the date that Athena was to sail, and Europe woke up on September 1st to the news that Germany was invading Poland. This meant that war was now virtually unavoidable. At the same time, and quite by coincidence, the British government had chosen September 1st to begin a long-planned evacuation of school children from large cities and industrial centers in England that were likely to become targets of German bombers in the event of war. These children were being moved by train and by bus to the countryside to be out of harm's way. Uh, and my grandmother on that same day, September 1st, was on a train heading north to Liverpool where she was going to, to uh, join, board the uh, Athenia on the following day. And as she traveled north, she began to see these sad little tableaus uh, at the train stations. And she de described one this way in her account. At Gloucester, we saw the first group of evacuated children. I shall never forget it. Torn away from their homes, all with their little knapsacks on their backs, their gas masks over their shoulders, and bands with numbers on their arms, in the charge of one or more teachers from different schools. Little tots, not knowing what it was all about, some crying, some laughing, unconscious of the danger they were fleeing from. It was then all the women in my compartment gave way to tears, and we began to realize how serious the situation had become. Well, despite the turmoil of these evacuations and the uncertainty created by uh, Germany's invasion of Poland, Athenia sailed as scheduled a little afternoon uh, down the Clyde River from Glasgow. She crossed over to uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, where she picked up 130 passengers that evening. And then overnight, she sailed back across the Irish Sea to Liverpool, where she dropped anchor in the Mersey River at 7.30 that Saturday morning, September 2nd. At about 11 o'clock that morning, the captain of the Athenia, a man named James Cook, went ashore to meet with officials in the Admiralty offices in Liverpool. He wanted to know what the latest information was on the possibility of war. It had been over 24 hours since Germany had invaded Poland and there was, had been no answer from either France or England. He also wanted to know what that would mean for his crossing to Canada if war was declared. When he came back in the early afternoon, Captain Cook brought with him a new course for Athenia to sail. The Admiralty wanted Athenia to sail some 30 miles north of the normal shipping lanes. And if war were declared, then she was to begin sailing a zigzag course. That is, she would maintain the same general heading for, for Montreal, but she would begin to sail a little to starboard, a little to port, starboard and port, and back and forth at regular intervals, the idea being to make it more difficult for a submarine to target the ship. In any case, Athenia would not have a naval escort for her crossing uh, to Canada, and uh, the, the open sea would be her best uh, defense. Now, undoubtedly, the Admiralty was relying on various international naval treaties, and one in particular called the London Submarine Protocol. This was a set of rules for submarine warfare that was established by a group of maritime nations that met in London in early 1936. Under these uh, rules, a submarine could not attack an unarmed, unescorted merchant ship without first giving warning. To do that, the submarine had to be on the surface of the ocean, had to get the ship to stop, and then put a boarding party on the merchant ship. This boarding party would then 
inspect the cargo, and if they found anything in the merchant ship's hold that would aid an enemy nation's war effort, then the ship could be sunk, but not until the crew was safely evacuated. So very impractical rules for a submarine, but what these people were trying to do was prevent unrestricted submarine warfare, which the Germans had used toward the end of the First World War to devastating effect. Basically, surprise attacks, attacking a ship at any time uh, once it was in dangerous waters. And so, um, 35 nations signed on to the London Submarine Protocol, including Germany. But in the three years that it was in, had been in existence, there had not been any major naval conflict to test the protocol. So that afternoon, Saturday, September 2nd, my grandmother and 500 other passengers boarded Athenia, and the ship left at about 4.30 that afternoon on a final leg to Canada. As she sailed down the Mersey River, she had a complement of 1,400 passengers and crew, and of the approximately 1,100 passengers on board, three quarters of them were women and children. Now I'm gonna hold up the narration here in order to introduce you to two key players uh, in terms of the Athenia story for the over the next 24 or 48 hours. Barnett Copeland was Athenia's chief officer. He was the second in command to Captain Cook for the Athenia. He was a 32-year-old Scotsman who'd gone to sea when he was only 15 years old. And by the time he was 19, he had become an officer in the British Merchant Navy. So obviously, he was very bright and very driven, very energetic, and he was well-liked by his fellow officers and the people who served under him. Now, Fritz Julius Lemp was a German submarine commander. Lemp, although he looks young and innocent in this picture, he was only 26 years old, which was young for a submarine commander at that point. But he was an eight-year Navy veteran, and in the last year or so that he had commanded a submarine, he'd acquired a well-earned reputation for boldness and remaining calm under pressure. Now, the submarine, or U-boat, as the Germans called them, that he commanded was U-30, and it was one of 20 ocean-going attack submarines that had left their ports in Germany as early as the third week in August to take up positions in waiting zones near the shipping lines north and south of the British Isles. And while the submarines were in these waiting zones, they maintained radio silence and they submerged any time they saw an airplane or a ship on the horizon because they wanted to retain the element of surprise uh, if, as they expected, they were, would be at war with Germany before uh, they returned from their patrols. Saturday evening, as Athenia steamed up the Irish Sea, a woman traveling alone was heading down to her cabin and she tripped and fell on the stairs and was knocked unconscious. Uh, Chief Officer Copeland was nearby and he helped to transport the woman to the ship's sick bay and he waited to hear the report from the doctor so he could report that to the captain when they met later that evening. Well, the doctor reported to Copeland that he had treated the woman's wounds, but she had not regained consciousness, and her face was badly swollen. So he had sedated her so she would stay asleep for another 24 hours, and the hopes that when she awoke, the swelling would have gone down somewhat. She wouldn't be in as much discomfort and they could better determine the extent of her injuries. The next morning, Sunday, September 3rd, several hundred miles to the east, the British ambassador to Germany, Sir Neville Henderson, and that's him carrying the umbrella on the left, paid a call at 9 a.m. in Berlin to the, British, or the German foreign minister and he delivered an ultimatum to the German government. The ultimatum said essentially that unless Germany was prepared to begin withdrawing her forces from Poland by noon that same day, September 3rd, a state of war would exist between Germany and England. 
Well, the deadline came and went with no word from Germany. And so 15 minutes later, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, went on the radio to announce to his countrymen and to the rest of the world that Britain was once again at war with Germany. The radio broadcast, uh, or this, this announcement, was picked up uh, by the Athenia on a radio broadcast from an Irish radio station. And so Athenia began immediately to sail her zigzag course. Uh, and the crew readied all 26 lifeboats just as a precaution. But by sundown, that Sunday evening, Athenia was 250 miles northwest of Ireland, and just about everybody on board thought that they had sailed beyond the reach of the new war. But they were wrong. A lookout on U-30 had spotted the smoke of Athenia at about 4.30 that afternoon. And Lemp had put his submarine on a course designed to intersect uh, that of the big ship. He then sailed at top speed of 16 knots on the surface of the ocean for two and a half hours until sunset when he thought he was getting close enough he might be spotted. And so he called the crew to battle stations and he submerged the boat. Now, what happened next, I describe this way uh, in my book. With U-30 running at periscope depth on a course now nearly parallel to the approaching ship, Lemp could make only eight knots with his electric motors. He calculated he would have less than 30 minutes before the big ship passed him. If he decided to attack, it would be a quick maneuver to round his boat to starboard and bring her bow into firing position, but he didn't have much time. Seated in the conning tower's small combat center directly above the U-boat's control room, Lemp raised the attack periscope. Through the eyepiece, he quickly spotted the ship, which continued on her general westerly course. One quick look and he lowered the scope, still unable to make a positive identification. He continued to track his unsuspecting prey for 20 more minutes, periodically raising and lowering the scope to follow her movements. Time was growing short. He had to decide. In the scope's eyepiece, the ship was now a little more than a mile away, a black silhouette against a darkening sky. Something was different. It took him a moment to realize the ship had extinguished all of her exterior lights, except for her port side running light. The act made him suspicious. Through the attack scope, he saw what could be a cargo boom, or could it be the barrel of a deck gun? In an instant, the anomalies fell into place like the tumblers of a combination lock. Blacked out, zigzagging, sailing out of normal shipping lanes, he did not question his conclusion. This was an armed merchant cruiser. Well, at 7.38, Lemp fired at least two torpedoes at Athenia. One ran true and struck the ship about two-thirds of the way down her port side in the number five hole just behind the engine room. The blast killed an estimated 50 passengers and crew. It also shut the engines down. It, made, uh, it took the main generator offline, and every light inside the ship went out as Athenia coasted to a stop in the twilight in the middle of the Atlantic. Now, uh, this is a model of the Athenia in uh, a museum in Glasgow. And you're looking at the port side of the ship, uh, right near the stern. The torpedo would have hit just ahead of here, uh, under the water line. And I put this up here so that you can visualize some of the activity that took place uh, on the ship after the torpedo hit. At the time uh, of the torpedo strike, Copeland was in the first class dining room uh, when the explosion occurred and the room was plunged into darkness, and he could feel it beginning to tilt to port, listing to port. It took him about two or three minutes in the dark to work his way out to this deck right here, the A deck, uh, and he came out uh, 
in the twilight and could tell that the stern was riding lower than it should be, but that the list on the ship had steadied at about six degrees. He then turned to come up these stairs, and as he did, he looked out to his left, and he saw the unmistakable silhouette of the German U-boat, and he knew immediately that Athenia had been torpedoed. And if he'd had any doubt, it would have been answered once he got up to the promenade deck here, because the deck was littered with debris. This large wooden hatch cover here had been blown completely away, uh, and there were four or five badly burned bodies lying on the deck around the open hold. As he crossed over to see if any of these people were still alive, the signal sounded to abandon ship. Uh, so he wasn't able really to, to do much for any of the people because he then had to come up this ladder, this uh, stairway, to the top deck, which is where his duty station was. He was in charge of launching and loading and launching the seven lifeboats located on the port side of the ship. And as he began to get his crew lined up and started to uh, get the lifeboats into position, the nurse from the ship's sick bay found him and said her patient was still asleep and she couldn't move her by herself. She needed help to get this woman off the ship. So Copeland told her not to worry about the patient. He would see to it that she was removed and he asked the nurse to go back down to the promenade deck and see if anything could be done for the poor souls he had seen lying there on the deck. He then turned to two sailors and told them to go down to sick bay. Uh, there's a woman in the woman's ward. She may still be unconscious and you need to get her off the ship right away. By then, passengers were streaming up on deck, uh, going to their muster stations and preparing to abandon the ship. And in almost Every account I read uh, in newspaper uh, interviews with survivors, in letters that survivors sent to their loved ones or friends back home, um, in affidavits that they filled out for government inquiries, most of them remarked on how calm the rest of the passengers seemed. There was no sense of panic, even though the ship was listing, its stern was riding low, and some people thought it was going to sink at any moment. But because of this, this calm sense uh, of the passengers, everything moved forward smoothly. About the only co uh, complication was that there were some passengers whose uh, d stations here, muster stations, were on the port side of the ship. They were concerned that the ship was leaning in that direction they didn't feel very safe that way, so they took themselves voluntarily over to the starboard side where uh, they were higher up from the water and felt safer. But it did complicate the loading and launching of the boats on the starboard side. Nevertheless, by about 9.15 that night, all 26 lifeboats had been safely deployed. And the only people left on board were the captain and, and his uh, chief officer and all the other six officers on the ship, about a dozen crewmen and about five passengers. Now, at about this time, Lemp surfaced U-30. He wanted to see what was happening to the ship he had torpedoed, to see if it was sinking fast enough. He didn't want the ship to be towed to a port and repaired. He wanted to get credit for this ship that he had hit. But while he was on the surface, his radio man sent him a note, said that he was picking up uh, distress single, signals from the ship he had torpedoed. She was called the Athenia, uh, and uh, she was, said she was sinking fast. So he checked U-30's copy of Lloyd's Register of Ships, the insurance company that insured so many ships at sea, and he discovered that Athenia was a passenger liner exactly the kind of ship his operational orders told him he should not attack. So this was a huge mistake on his part. A mess, a mess he kept calling it. Why was she sailing blacked out? In any case, he decided that he would not help anybody, not offer any aid, which he was required to do under the protocol, and he would not report what he'd done right away to headquarters, he would not break radio silence. And so he left the scene. 
At about this same time, the captain asked uh, Copeland to go below and assess the damage because the captain wanted to know the same thing Lemp wanted to know. How long can we stay afloat? Will we be able to tow the ship to a near port, nearby port? And will she be uh, able to be uh, rescued? Well, Copeland took a flashlight, went below uh, decks where it was dark, and he walked every passenger deck, uh, calling out to make sure people were not trapped. He checked sick bay, saw the men's ward was locked, the women's ward was open, and the bed was empty. So he was satisfied that the woman had been taken off. And he checked the progress of the water on each succeedingly lower deck, and finally came to the conclusion, which he reported back to the captain, that although Athenia would stay afloat for several more hours, likely, the water would not be stopped. It would continue to come slowly into the ship, and that she would not last long enough to be towed to any port. So the captain ordered the rest of the people on board to abandon ship. They called a motor launch, one of the two motor launches among the lifeboats. And they all got into the motor launch and left Athenia to her fate at about 11 o'clock that night. Now, arrayed around Athenia in a, a rough circle were 26 lifeboats. They knew they had to keep that ship in sight because that's where the rescue ships were going to come. But the conditions in the lifeboats were not terribly pleasant. It was cold in an open boat on the ocean at night. There was a wind rising, and the swells were going from six to eight feet. And to make matters worse, there was a nice little intermittent rain that came and went. Several of the people in the lifeboats were wearing only their night clothes underneath their life jackets because they had been in bed when the emergency signal sounded. There were a lot of other people who were in the lifeboats who didn't have any life jackets. My grandmother had been up on deck when the torpedo struck. She was taking fresh air in before going down to go to bed, and she had worn her heavy coat up, but when the torpedo struck and the lights went out, she didn't want to go down three decks, four decks in the dark, and she wasn't even sure she could locate her cabin where her life jacket was. And there were many other passengers in the same situation. Now, some of those lifeboats, the ones especially launched on the starboard side, were so crowded people had to stand. My grandmother was standing in a lifeboat, but because she was wearing her heavy jacket, she was given a baby to hold under the jacket to keep the child warm and out of the rain. And she did that for an hour, trying to keep her balance as it went, the shell lifeboat went up and over the swells. Uh, but she managed to do that for an hour before she was relieved. Um, there were also lifeboats that had leaks in them, and the passengers, where they could find these leaks, would take, uh, tear off pieces of their clothing and stuff them into the cracks to try and slow down the, uh, the rate of the water coming in. And these, these were the conditions that lasted uh, for some lifeboats anywhere from five to eight hours, depending on when they were picked up by rescue ships. Because the first rescue ship to arrive on the scene was a Norwegian freighter called the Newt Nelson. Uh, she rescued 430 passengers, but she was riding high in the water because she didn't have uh, her, any cargo. Rather, like you see it in the picture here, and you'll notice where her propellers were turning, well, a lifeboat got caught in the ship's propellers and was chopped to pieces, and it threw nearly 90 people into the water, and it was estimated that a at least half of those people did not survive the night. The second ship to arrive was a luxury yacht, the Southern Cross. She had once been owned by Howard Hughes and was now the property of a Swedish millionaire who was on his way to Bermuda with his wife where he was going to wait out the war. But he'd altered course to come by and pick up uh, survivors. And to give you an idea of the size of this yacht, she rescued 376 people, including my grandmother. So while she was on the yacht, somehow Rhoda found out that the source of her benefactor's wealth was the Electrolux Vacuum Cleaner Company. She made a promise to herself, if she got back to Rochester, New York, she was going to buy an Electrolux vacuum cleaner. And she did. The, just before dawn, uh, three Royal Navy destroyers arrived on scene. And while 
one of those destroyers uh, conducted anti-submarine maneuvers to make sure that there were no U-boats in the area. HMS Electra and HMS Escort uh, waded in and, and uh, rescued almost 500 more survivors. Uh, now, when the sun came up on Monday morning, September 4th, it revealed that Athenia was still afloat. Although her stern was under the water and she was now at about 20 degrees, she was still afloat. And this is the view that very likely Copeland would have had when he was picked up by HMS Electra, one of the last lifeboats uh, to be rescued. And while he was on board Electra, he checked around the other uh, rescue ships and found that the woman patient who had been taken off the ship wasn't on any of the rescue ships. Somehow, she had been left aboard the Athenia. Well, he couldn't figure out how this happened, but he was responsible for her. He had promised this, the nurse that he was going to go uh, make sure that she was safely taken off. And if she was alive on that ship, he was not going to let her go down with the ship. So he talked the Electra's captain into giving him the launch and took two uh, volunteers and went across, two volunteers from the Athenia crew, went across to Athenia, found a rope ladder still dangling in the water. They climbed up the rope ladder, got across the deck, down the stairs to the B deck where the uh, sick bay was located and he immediately saw what he didn't realize or hadn't noticed the night before and that was the door he thought was locked had not been locked it had been jammed shut by the force of the explosion so the three men working together were able to force the door open and there was the woman still unconscious in the bed with the water just below the mattress so they were able to get her into a blanket and get her back up the stairs, across the deck, somehow down the rope ladder, into the launch, and back across to Electra. Fifteen minutes later, Athenia sank. So for his bravery and leadership in all of this, Copeland was awarded an Order of the British Empire, an OBE, uh, in the following January when the King's honors were announced. And it's one of the highest honors. He, he was named an officer in the Order of the British Empire. A very high honor indeed that the King can bestow upon a civilian for bravery. The last uh, rescue ship to arrive was the city of Flint, which we'd already mentioned. And because the Southern Cross did not have enough provisions to carry 376 people all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, the city of Flint took two-thirds of those passengers who wanted to continue their journey and went to Halifax. She was American. America was not in the war. She was a neutral ship, and she was not worried about being attacked by a German submarine. The other remaining third of the passengers on the Southern Cross transferred to one of the two uh, British destroyers that took their 500-plus uh, survivors back to Glasgow, Scotland. And the Newt Nelson, the large Norwegian uh, freighter, was also from a neutral country, Norway, and she took her 430 survivors to the nearest neutral port, which was Galway, Ireland. So this meant that the survivors were taken by four ships to three ports in three different countries. Now, communications at the time were largely given over to the new, to military matters in the new war, and they were somewhat limited, so it took a while to compile a list, a com comprehensive list of who had survived and who had died. But the final accounting did show that 112 passengers and crew members died as a result of the attack on the Athenia. But 1,306 passengers and crew survived. And so the Athenia sinking was not nearly the tragedy it might have been. But what we can say is for the British, the first war dead were not sailors and were not soldiers on a battlefield. They were civilians in an unarmed passenger ship. And I guess we can say that uh, the 112 men, women, and children who died on Athenia were a portent of what was going to happen 
to civilians in this war around the world. So I will be happy to take your questions now. I've gone a little bit long, but uh, uh, we'll see if uh, anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Yes, uh, the question was, what happened to the submarine commander? Well, as soon as he got back to Germany, he told his commanding officer, Carl Donitz, what he had done. Uh, by then, however, because there had been no word from the submarine, Germany had denied any responsibility for sinking Athenia. And no less a person than uh, the Führer himself said, to, we are going to continue to deny it. And they did throughout the war, and it wasn't until the Nuremberg trials that uh, Donuts admitted in a deposition that U-30 had sunk Athenia. Now, wow. yes, what, what just a, uh, Did the woman survive? Uh, she was taken off? Uh, no, she did not. Oh, she okay. was taken to a hospital in Glasgow, and she never regained consciousness <laughs> and uh, died about three days later. <laughs> and for, uh, undoubtedly, yes. Uh, yes? Have they ever located the ship? The question is, have they ever located the ship? Well, they think they have, yes. Um, through uh, sonar survey uh, uh, images of the ocean around uh, Ireland, there is something that looks very much like the size and shape of Athenia lying on the ocean floor in the Rock Hall Bank, which is not that deep, actually. I think it's about 200 meters deep. Um, but nobody that I know of has, has dived on the ship or taken pictures of it or any, but, but it, it, they know where it is and it just has, has not uh, been explored. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The question, if you didn't hear it, is uh, did the, the Athenia appear to be typical of passenger ships of that era because uh, she looked more like a supply ship than uh, a modern passenger ship? Well, uh, yeah, she was fairly typical of uh, passenger ships at that time. They didn't have the high profile they have now. They weren't as nearly as big as they are now. Athenia was only 13,500 tons, so she wasn't a really big ship. She was sort of a mid-sized passenger ship. So it was easy to conflate her with other ships, especially if it was getting dark and her silhouette wasn't that, uh, that obvious. So uh, yeah, it, she was typical of that time. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, in your book you talk about uh, the two uh, German officers. Um, uh, maybe a gambling a little bit over a, a bottle of gin or something, oh. saying, uh, <laughs> who will be the first to have the prize? Right. Do you think that this uh, sort of motivated this captain well, to want to get that ship sunk first? I have a confession to make, yeah. and that is that this is a novel, yeah. so there is some uh, license uh, and so I, I invented that scene, oh, okay. although those two captains were in the same class, uh, so they knew each other, uh, but I, I did want to give uh, some sense of motivation. Uh, he, was, he was eager to prove, I sense that he was eager to prove himself uh, to all of these older captains who were in their early to mid-30s, and he wanted to show that he could be uh, just as tough and, and just as effective as they were. Uh, yes? Why did you decide a novel and not a nonfiction book? Why, why did I decide to write a novel instead of a nonfiction book? I chose a novel because I wanted to involve the reader on a more emotional level. Uh, I stayed very close to the facts that were known. Um, and uh, the characteristics of the people that I knew, uh, se several of them had written about themselves, had written about their experiences, and I interviewed uh, two people uh, who are in the book, uh, who were youngsters at the time, 
and I, I talked to a number of, their, of the descendants of people who were in the book. So I had a fairly good idea of who these people were. But I, uh, there had been a nonfiction book written in the 1950s, the late 1950s. And there had been another one published in 2009 in Germany. But it was in German, and the publisher was not going to bring it out in, in English. So I just felt. Uh, I could involve the audience more immediately with a novel as opposed to a nonfiction. And it's a good thing I did because I was uh, about a third of the way through the book when the U.S. Naval Institute Press announced that they were publishing a book called Athenia Torpedoed by a uh, Canadian uh, college professor, Francis Carroll, and, uh, and it's nonfiction. So I wasn't in direct competition with it. And it's a, by the way, it's a very good book. And if you really want to know every aspect of what was happening, right down to the reparations and what, what passengers were paid for their trouble and everything, he's got it all in that book. And it's very readable, and it's not a real long book. What's the name of it? Athena Torpedoed. Yeah. OK, are there any other questions? OK. Well, there are books for sale back there. I'm happy to sign. And thank you very much again for coming out.